old-fashioned radio there, right beside the computer, they discovered that they got these funny noises out of the computer, and then they clipped the antenna of the computer onto the bus bar, as they called it. That's still a good word, I think. And uh, so I don't think it was S100, but <laughs> any rate. <laughs> they, and they found out that if they put the antenna in even close, they didn't have to flip it to it by various means, that they could get various tones. And what was important at the moment was this enabled them to diagnose what kind of a loop or miscalculation the computer was carrying on just then. It was a very important diagnostic tool. But to some of us, we thought that's an interesting phenomenon that we ought to explore further. So one night, I stayed up and I made the experiments as to how long each instruction took and how long you could put through this loop and delay it and so forth so that certain signals would come back to that bus bar at certain times. And I equated this, of course, to the various notes on the normal diatonic scale. And uh, we didn't try any Persian music or any East Indian music or any of the other uh, odd scales. We just were thankful that we could make it play Auld Lang Syne and Yankee Doodle. And uh, pretty soon, we had the Air Force, of course, uh, a year or so later, thinking that they were the inventors of computer music. They were able to display the, uh, a tune for the Air Force when they received the UNIVAC. The uh, David Taylor model basin people made it play Anchors Away and so on. So the computer music is a little known history there. But <clears throat> without uh, going back and remembering everything I can remember, I did bring along these mementos here, which I say I'm not sure whether they're in Claude Kagan's barn or not. But uh, speaking of microprocessors, I wondered whether he has one of these. He may have. He's a very great collector. Yes. This is a microprocessor. First one I ever acquired. And in the days when I was collecting mechanical, mostly electric motor driven computers, uh, because I was working on weather work and I didn't have the, the real big high powered stuff, why well, I, I got myself one of these. It comes from Liechtenstein. Do you have one, Claude? The Curta? What it's called? It's sometimes known as a pepper grinder. I thought you might just want a, a whiff of the pepper. Uh, but here it is in the flesh. You take the top off the pepper grinder and you grind it here. Of course, for data entry, you have to slide sliders up here. But everything you need for multiplication and division and so forth to something like 10, 12 digits is there. And uh, that's the most uh, micro town, micro, what, micro sized computer <laughs> that I ever saw in the mechanical form. Doesn't have an electric motor, but that's a real microprocessor in the sense that I've never seen a mechanical digital multiplier, divider, machine, so forth, reduced to those terms. It's a real work of art by those Liechtenstein designers. Now, from the ridiculous to the extreme sublime, Ah, yes, here it is. This is just the opposite of what you want. Here is a device which is purchasable in gift stores, and it was given to me on a birthday last year. It demonstrates one foolish thing you can do with seven bits. <laughs> this is not even a traditional bite size or eight bit computer, you see. These seven bits, however, should be more memorable to the uh, uh, Western Electric and the Bell Labs people and so forth because the secret to this puzzle is something sometimes known as the gray code, which is used in a lot of analog to digital transformations. And uh, so it's a puzzle where there's only one way you can work it, 
And so, in a sense, it remembers one long uh, permutation of how you put, slide these things around to accomplish something. I won't describe now, but I'm just saying, there's a piece of plastic which embodies a kind of computer. And nowadays, you can buy something better than an ENIAC for the price that was paid for this. And I have something better than an ENIAC at home. I didn't bother to bring it along because everybody knows about it. You know, Texas Instrument this or all these different things. And so my conclusion before I uh, sit down and let my wife tell you about the good side of all this is that I feel that this is a very important stage in the history of computers because we're at last letting the public in, letting the populace in, whether you want to call them personal computers or popular computers or whatever you want to call them, they're at last getting in to the schools and the education. They're affecting and going to affect everybody. Now, <clears throat> I understood from somebody that was uh, not present in the touring room today that uh, there is a, a fellow that's uh, called uh, something like Turing. I think it's Doring, A. Doring. He's the name of a robot. And he has published a paper in the Robot Society which is on the subject of how can you tell whether one of these things that goes around as human beings, are they really human, you know? Or maybe are they really robots? And it turns out the touchstone, of course, is something very similar to what Turing proposed. First of all, can a, a human write a computer program as well as these robots can? And the second thing is, what you really got to do is get them in conversation, say in a terminal, where one's in the other room, and this one's in this room, and you hold a conversation, and you're kept in ignorance as to whether the person in the other room is a robot or not. And if, you, if he can behave like a robot, that's the touchstone. Because any human being, you know what they're like. They make mistakes. They do all kinds of things. But one robot will know that another robot is there when, by conversation over a terminal, he will know that this can't be a human faking it. It must be a real robot. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know how you get this off, but it comes off somewhere. Yeah, all righty. Well, I'm not used to getting up in front of an audience talking the way John is, so I'm more inclined to stick to what I think is the subject. <laughs> <laughs> I, however, I must say that I am terribly impressed with everything that I have seen here today. And all I can think of is that Virginia Slim's ad that says, You've come a long way, baby. <laughs> well, uh, since supposedly I wanted to talk to you about being, uh, and I must cl uh, correct Claude again, uh, I was not the first computer or programmer. <laughs> they used to call us computers in those days because uh, during the war, all during the war, uh, we uh, just most of us operated desk calculators. We just sat there at these uh, desk calculators and worked out the uh, numerical integration of the trajectories. And uh, we acquired the name computer. And as a matter of fact, I think that was our official title. So when we uh, were turned over to the machine, or the machine was turned over to us, we kept that title. 
Actually, I was one of six girls who were trained uh, to uh, operate the ENIAC. Now, uh, I don't even know whether I could say we were trained to operate the ENIAC. Uh, it's, uh, if I can remember rightly, the uh, war in Europe ended about this time of year, around the end of April in 1945. And just about that time, the ENIAC w was finally being built. Now, I was working, it was one of about 100 girls uh, who had been math majors in college, who had been hired by the Army to, to compute these trajectories during the war. But uh, I uh, worked at the Moore School. And the secret backroom project that was going on was a computer. We knew that. We didn't know very much else about it. Anyway, when the war did end in Europe, uh, they decided that here was this computer. It was finally going to be ready. And although it wouldn't help to end the war, it would, might be useful for something. So they selected six of the girls who were working there and asked us if we'd be willing to learn how to use this new computer. Well, what we were used to was a little desk calculator. And uh, the idea of um, having something the size of this, if you would look at that picture, that room was uh, about 20 feet long and about 12 feet wide, and it had computers all over it. So uh, we thought it was quite a challenge. And uh, they said, uh, well, uh, it's like this. The manuals have not been written. <laughs> uh, but as long as you're willing to learn it, we will give you all the wiring diagrams and you can... <laughs> plow your way through. So uh, that's what we did. We learned what a gate was and what a resistor was. And uh, when uh, a pulse would go through here, and we'd track it around and find out that it would come out at a certain time. Now, that was the big secret of the whole machine, that there were uh, 100,000 pulses per second were released by the uh, something that released pulses, whatever it was. <laughs> and uh, these uh, came out in what they called um, ad times. There were 20, uh, 20 pulses to an ad time. And there were, there were 5,000 ad times in a second. That, so in this uh, 20 pulse thing, uh, there was a timing in which, uh, for the first 10, the pulses uh, the, that represented the digits ran through. And then when an addition was completed, a pulse was emitted at time 20, which would tell you that the operation was finished and that you could go and pick up another operation. Well, uh, as you can see, there, there, in this picture, there were these uh, big black <laughs> things. Each one was a represent a 10-digit number. Or if you hook two of them together, it represented a 20-digit number. Well, you had to actually, in programming, designate which one of those uh, accumulators, as we call them, you wanted the number to go to, and which one you wanted the uh, add in to come from, and where you wanted the sum put, and how many times you wanted this to happen, and so on. Well, not only did we have to uh, figure out the program as such, but we actually had to stack the trays of, uh, there were trays that carried all the digit pulses, and then other stacks of trays that carried the program pulses. And these trays were about 20 feet long. <laughs> it took four of us to carry them. And uh, the whole ENIAC was a very familiar, very similar to a telephone plug board in which you would plug from these trays where the digits came along up in to tell you whether you wanted to add, subtract, and so on in this machine. Then there were other uh, wires that came from the program pulse would tell you when uh, you'd pick the pulse up and take it down and tell you at which time to come in. So we had a, well, you'd say a double job, the mental job of programming it, 
from the point of view of the timing of the machine. And the second job, once you've done that, is to carry the trays around and plug them in. So uh, it was uh, quite a job, very, very interesting. It never seemed like work because of the enthusiasm. There were six of us girls, and we worked on shifts. It, it, all during the war, uh, everybody had worked on shifts. And now I often think that uh, people complain about work. Well, during the war, everybody worked a six-day work, a uh, six-day week. We uh, worked 48 hours a week, and we worked at uh, two weeks on day shift, two weeks on night shift. And many hours, many times we worked maybe 16 or 20 hours. And so did all the engineers. Because even when we started to learn the machine, all the parts of the ENIAC weren't yet finished. So uh, the engineers were working in there while we were trying to program. Well, uh, as soon as the, uh, the uh, ENIAC stayed at the Moore School and really did a lot of good work for about a year, and then they decided to move to Aberdeen. And about that time, most of all the girls got pretty tired of it, so we all married the engineers and went home. But you know, being uh, programmers, that every program has a bug, and uh, we encounter a bug now. Uh, I got here and I found out that that uh, uh, citation hasn't been printed yet. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, those of us who work with computers and work with uh, virtual memories can uh, think of uh, this as a virtual citation. <laughs> You know what it is, you can use it, but it doesn't really exist. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mythical beast like a unicorn or a virgin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have the uh, citation to read uh, here, uh, but I can imagine what uh, that citation had to say. Uh, let me tell you a little story. I have a son who is 14 years old, and he is uh, real mad about computers. And on the wall of uh, his uh, uh, bedroom is a big chart. You probably saw uh, this, a big uh, tree that shows uh, computers coming out from a stem, the stem being the ENIAC, and uh, the various branches being the uh, various computers that have been developed since then, and the roots now are Babbage and Pascal and our speaker, guest speaker, Mr. Markley. And uh, when I told my little son that I was going to meet him today in person and present the citation to him, he was tremendously impressed. And he said, Father, you're going to speak to a living root. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I think that we can all appreciate this. This is the root from which our tree has grown. And uh, we are all on those branches, maybe like little insects. Uh, I hope that we are the bees that pollinate that tree and not the, the little weevils that eat the, the leaves. <laughs> <laughs> but here among us, we have one of the roots, one of the people that really made it all possible, made this gathering possible 
and made this tremendous explosion in uh, information processing possible that's really changing the whole world today. And not only is he originator, but he's also a man of great vision. I have uh, recently had occasion to read some of the papers that he has written, and I see that not only his, uh, has he been uh, propagating, of course, the digital computer, the ENIAC, but also he has foreseen a lot of changes, some of which have taken place, some of which uh, are still going to take place in the future. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, I've seen one paper where he argues for the use of telephone to uh, transmit data. And he was wondering why this hasn't been done at that time yet. And of course, by now, this is bread and butter to all of us. Uh, another idea that he was propagating is the idea of uh, computing in parallel. He was wondering, uh, comparing the ENIAC, which had a lot of parallelism with all the computers in existence in the 60s, I guess, uh, where the computing was done serious, serially. Uh, I think that there is a change which now with the ICs and microprocessor is going to take place, and we are going to go one step further beyond we are, what we are doing now, and instead of doing bit by bit, uh, uh, computing will be doing things in parallel in the future. So uh, here we have a man of vision, a man of foresight, and a man that really honored us here by coming to us and telling us how it really was. Thank you.